Hi friends, welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ILOPathology.com. In today's topic, I will be uh, continuing with the topic of amyloidosis. If you are here uh, for the first time, I would suggest you to go and view amyloidosis part 1. In part 1, we have discussed about the definition of amyloidosis and then uh, in detail about the properties of amyloid proteins. See, the link to watch the tutorial is uh, given below in the description. Okay, the learning outcomes for uh, today's uh, tutorial will be we will understand the basic mechanism of pathogenesis and then we'll discuss about how a AL and AA type of amyloid and other different types of amyloid are formed. And then we will learn the classification of amyloidosis and then we'll discuss a uh, few entities in that classification. Okay, the pathogenesis of amyloidosis, the basic mechanism is abnormal folding of proteins. Okay, they are also referred to as misfolded proteins. I have discussed about the misfolded proteins in the previous video. To summarize, we know that proteins are made up of chains of amino acids, isn't it? These chains fold into three-dimensional structures and the folding is really very important for the function of these proteins. Sometimes after the formation of you know, the proteins, the folds uh, might release or there will be abnormal folding and these are called misfolded or abnormal folding of proteins. So what really happens when the proteins are misfolded is that the normal function of the proteins are lost. Second one, apart from the normal functions being lost, they become resistant to degradation. That is the most important thing. So what really happens in the normal scenario? We'll see that. Under normal circumstances, what happens is these misfolded proteins are degraded. The degradation basically happens either intracellularly or extracellularly. So intracellularly, the degradation is by proteasome pathway. So this proteasome pathway is the major proteolytic pathway. Okay, what really happens here is that these misfolded proteins are tagged by ubiquitin and this ubiquitinated proteins are degraded by proteasomes. Extracellularly, these misfolded proteins are degraded by macrophages. So what happens in amyloidosis? In amyloidosis, the control mechanisms fail. When I say control mechanism fails, it could be uh, because of some faulty proteasome pathways or some abnormalities in the macrophages. Also, there could be mutations which favors misfolding. Once the control mechanisms fail or once there are mutations which favor misfolding, then that leads to accumulation and aggregation and that results in the formation of fibril. So that was all about the basic mechanism. Now let us understand the pathogenesis in uh, some more detail. Okay, so it, two things can happen. One, normal proteins when they are produced in abnormal numbers, and two, the proteins which are formed are mutant forms. So it could be production of normal amounts of mutant proteins. Now let us understand what really happens under these circumstances. So first we'll discuss normal proteins when produced in abnormal numbers. Let us assume that there is a mutation which leads to monoclonal B lymphocyte proliferation. So once there is monoclonal proliferation of B lymphocytes, obviously it means to say that there is increased number of plasma cells. We all know that the plasma cells are the ones which synthesize immunoglobulins. So there will be increased production of immunoglobulin light chains. So the basic thing happening here is that there is increased production of immunoglobulin light chains. There is enormous amount of light chains. So once you have these abnormal amounts of normal proteins, you know, there is always a possibility that some of these proteins might get abnormally folded or some of these proteins can get misfolded. So under these circumstances, if there is incomplete proteolysis, that results in accumulation of amyloid proteins. In this case, it is amyloid light chain protein or it is also referred to as AL protein. So let us see the second scenario. Second scenario where there is chronic inflammatory diseases. So whenever there is a chronic inflammation, we know that there will be activation of macrophages and these macrophages releases interleukin 1 and interleukin 6. Okay. So these interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 in the liver, they helped in production of increased amount of these acute phase proteins. In this case, acute phase protein is serum amyloid associated protein or SAA protein. Again, the same mechanism, whenever there is an incomplete proteolysis of these proteins, that results in accumulation of amyloid associated protein. I hope you have understood that AL protein and AA protein are basically they are normal proteins which are produced in abnormal numbers. So the next important pathogenetic mechanism is production of normal amounts of mutant proteins. Take uh, the example of transthyretine. 
So whenever you have a mutation of the gene involving the production of transthyretin, it results in the production of mutant transthyretin. Okay. So this mutant transthyretin is resistant to degradation and once it is resistant to degradation obviously these proteins tend to aggregate and that results in accumulation of amyloid TTR protein or ATTR protein. So all these things result in the development of amyloidosis. So this is all about the pathogenesis of amyloidosis. Now once we know that there are different types of amyloid proteins deposited in the tissues. Now let us see what is the mechanism of damage by these proteins to the tissues. So the first and the foremost uh, mechanism of damage to the tissues is pressure effect which can lead to atrophy. Okay. Now we cannot explain all the damage by this particular effect alone. So the second mechanism could be whenever uh, the amyloid gets deposited in the vessel wall. Okay. See the accumulation of amyloid in the vessel wall can lead to narrowing of the lumen and subsequently might lead to ischemia. Okay. The second thing is that it can also cause increased permeability of these blood vessels. These amyloid proteins can also be directly cytotoxic okay for example amyloidogenic light chain accumulation in the cardiac cells they are and lastly uh, prefibrillar oligomer so even before the formation of fibrillar proteins there is something called prefibrillar oligomers these are found to be more injurious than the actual fibrils this is so uh, particularly in the case of alzheimer's disease and attr amyloidosis so moving on to uh, classification of amyloidosis so this classification is based on the clinical pathological features. So it is classified into three categories. One, generalized or systemic amyloidosis. Two, localized amyloidosis. And three, hereditary amyloidosis. So we'll understand each of these categories uh, under these headings. One, we will see what the precursor proteins are. We will see what is the fibril protein associated with this type of amyloidosis and lastly we will uh, look into the various associated diseases under each of these settings so in generalized amyloidosis there are different subcategories like you know one primary amyloidosis so this is the amyloidosis which is associated with immunocyte dyscrasias the precursor proteins for this type of amyloidosis is immunoglobulin light chains and the fibril protein is al type the associated diseases are all these immunologic dyscrasias like multiple myeloma and other plasma cell dyscrasias. The second one is secondary amyloidosis. So it is also referred to as reactive systemic amyloidosis. Okay, It is secondary to chronic inflammation. So the precursor protein as we have discussed before is serum amyloid associated protein. Okay, And the fibril protein is AA or amyloid associated proteins. And the diseases associated with this is all chronic inflammatory diseases. We shall discuss a bit more about this in the next few minutes. Okay. The third one is hemodialysis associated amyloidosis. Here the precursor protein is beta 2 microglobulin and the fibril protein is A beta 2 microglobulin. And the associated disease is chronic renal failure. Now coming to localized amyloidosis. So it can be senile cerebral amyloidosis where the precursor protein is APP. And the fibril protein is A beta. Okay, the associated disease is Alzheimer's disease. The second one is endocrine type of localized amyloidosis. Okay, so the amyloid deposits can be seen in different endocrine organs like uh, thyroid or islet of Langerhans. So, in cases of uh, certain tumors of thyroid uh, like medullary thyroid carcinomas, the precursor proteins in the form of calcitonin gets deposited as amyloid proteins and they're called as A cal. And in cases of type 2 diabetes mellitus, the islet amyloid peptide can deposit as AIAPP in islet of Langerhans. The third and the distinct category of uh, classification is hereditary amyloidosis. So in this category, there are three different uh, subcategories. One, familial Mediterranean fever, where the precursor protein is SAAR, serum amyloid associated protein. Okay, and the fibril protein is AA. Familial amyloidotic neuropathy, where the precursor protein is transthyretin and the fibril protein is ATTR and thirdly systemic senile amyloidosis where the precursor protein is again transthyretin and the fibril protein is ATTR. So this is how uh, amyloidosis is classified. Now let's move on to understand uh, in detail about few of these subcategories. Okay, The first one is reactive systemic amyloidosis which is also referred to as secondary amyloidosis because it is almost always secondary to chronic inflammatory diseases. Previously, tuberculosis, bronchiectasis and chronic osteomyelitis were the most important conditions for uh, this type of amyloidosis. 
Now in the present era, because of the advancement in the treatment of these diseases, the secondary amyloidosis now it's most commonly because of rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylosis, inflammatory bowel diseases, okay, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. These are the ones which are most commonly associated with secondary amyloidosis. Secondary amyloidosis is also common in drug abusers, particularly heroin injection abuse. That's because of chronic skin infections in these individuals who are exposed to drug abuse. And lastly, some solid tumors like renal cell carcinomas and Hodgkin lymphoma, they also are associated with secondary amyloidosis. Mind you, these are non-immunocyte tumors. So, in the case of primary amyloidosis, it is a light chain which predominates, whereas in the case of secondary amyloidosis, it is the serum amyloid associated protein which can deposit as amyloid associated protein in the tissues. Yeah. Moving on to uh, hemodialysis associated amyloidosis. This type of amyloidosis is found in patients with chronic renal failure. So, what really happens in chronic renal failure is beta 2 microglobulin is increased in the serum of these patients. In the past, when the filters were not good, okay, this beta 2 microglobulin could not be filtered. And that's how this particular protein was not degraded properly because of increased accumulation and it would get deposited in the form of A beta 2 microglobulin. But now in the present era, there are good dialysis filters which can even filter this beta 2 microglobulin and that's how there is decreased incidence of hemodialysis associated amyloidosis. Moving on to a very uh, important and the distinct category of amyloidosis that is heridofemilial amyloidosis. There are two major types, one familial amyloidotic neuropathy and two familial Mediterranean fever. So familial Mediterranean fever is an autosomal recessive condition where it is an auto-inflammatory syndrome where there is excessive production of interleukin-1 in response to inflammation. So this particular disease is characterized by attacks of fever, repeated attacks of fever with serosal inflammation like you know, pericarditis, peritonitis, and pleuritis. So, this particular entity is associated with widespread amyloidosis and then the fibril proteins are amyloid associated proteins because you know that SAA is increased in these cases. That's because of excessive production of interleukin-1 and this interleukin-1 results in increased production of serum amyloid associated protein from the liver. So, coming to familial amyloidotic neuropathy, this is an autosomal dominant condition where there is deposition of amyloid in the peripheral and autonomic nerves. Okay, Here, the fibrils are made up of mutant transthyretins. Now, what is this localized amyloidosis? So, this means the amyloid deposit is limited to a single tissue or a single organ. Okay, It can be microscopic foci or may be evident grossly as nodular masses. The most common sites for localized amyloidosis are the lung, the larynx, the skin, the bladder, tongue, etc. Okay, Microscopically, you know, you find lymphocytes and plasma cells in the periphery of these amyloid deposits. In some of these cases, the amyloid uh, can contain AL type of protein. So this is about localized amyloidosis. So in summary, we understood the basic mechanism and then the mechanism involving the deposition of different types of amyloid proteins. And then we understood the classification of amyloidosis and then we discussed about few entities of you know, uh, these subcategories. In the next uh, part of uh, tutorial, I'll be discussing about the diagnosis of amyloid, the various special strains used to you know, diagnose amyloid, the clinical features, and most importantly, the morphology of organs in a melodosis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button. Do comment. Please do subscribe for you to get updated on you know, videos which would be uploaded regularly.